Napoleon himself with gold utensils. But the king of Siam, he was fed with aluminum utensils. You see, aluminum was the most valuable metal on the planet, worth more than gold and platinum. It's the reason that the tip of the Washington Monument is made of aluminum. You see, even though aluminum is 8.3% of the Earth by mass, it doesn't come as a pure metal. It's all bound by oxygen and silicates. But then a technology of electrolysis came along and literally made aluminum so cheap that we use it with throwaway mentality. So let's project this analogy going forward. We think about energy scarcity. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on a planet that is bathed with 5,000 times more energy than we use in a year. From Kenya to Colombia, from Iraq to Korea, in slums, in schools, in prisons, and in theaters, every day people gather at TEDx events around the world to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. Today, you are part of a global conversation about our shared future. So what is this TEDx? TEDx is an initiative of the TED Conference, a nonprofit devoted to ideas worth spreading. We grant free licenses to allow TED-like events to spread globally. This event today is based on the TED Conference format and ideals, but is independently organized by your local community. So please make sure to thank the team of volunteers who worked so hard on today's event. It's their ideas dedication and time that made it all possible. It's they who booked all the speakers, and the views you'll hear today are, of course, those of those speakers, not necessarily of TEDs. But we hope their talks spark an exciting conversation among you. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for openness and for critical thinking, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you'll take out. And now, on with the show. Good evening and welcome to Gems X TEDx Wellington Academy All Kill. I'm Aria Prabhu, head girl here at the Academy. And I'm Bradley Hallam, head boy at the Academy. Bradley and I are delighted to be your hosts for this evening. To launch proceedings, we'd like to invite the organizer of this TEDx conference, Mr. Rohan Roberts, onto stage to say a few words. Mr. Roberts is the Director of Innovation and Future Learning at the Academy. He has organized six TEDx events in the past, and in 2015, he was invited to TED Global in Geneva. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Roberts. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to TEDx, James Wellington Academy, al -Kail. I'm sure most of you are already aware, but just in case you aren't, I'd like to say a few words about the difference between TED and TEDx. TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. It is essentially the world's foremost intellectual conference that brings together the most brilliant people on the planet to talk about ideas worth spreading. The first TED conference took place in 1990, and in keeping with its Silicon Valley origins, uh, those early TED Talks focused primarily on technology and design. However, since then, TED has broadened its perspective to focus on talks about scientific, cultural, humanitarian, and academic topics as well. Those early TED Talks were held behind closed doors and weren't open to the general public. But that's changed since 2006, when TED began to offer its videos online for free viewing under 
a Creative Commons license. And those TED Talks proved immensely popular. By 2009, three years after TED went online, TED videos had 140,000 views. By 2010, that went up to 23 million views. And by 2011, that shot up to 190 million views. But by 2012, boom, it hit a billion views. That is a textbook example of exponential growth. And what that indicated was that the world had a keen appetite for intellectual ideas. And that's where TEDx comes in. TEDx is a grassroots initiative created in the spirit of TED's overall mission of ideas worth spreading. TEDx events are organized locally and independently, but under license from TED. So every year, there are over 3,000 TEDx events that take place in 130 different countries around the world. This evening, here at the Academy, we have a license to host our own TEDx event. And the theme is Unlearn, Relearn. Now, Terence McKenna was an ethnobiologist, a philosopher, and a prominent figure in the counterculture movement. And he once said, what we now face is a crisis of two things, of conditioning and of consciousness. We now have the technological ability and the engineering skills to save our planet, to cure disease, to feed the hungry, and to eradicate poverty. But what we lack is the intellectual vision, the ability to change our minds. We must now decondition ourselves from 10,000 years of bad behavior, and it isn't easy. The pandemic had a dramatic and disruptive impact on all aspects of our society. A vaccine is slowly starting to ease our collective anxieties. However, the reasons why the pandemic hit us so hard, well, those reasons aren't going away anytime soon. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, do we want to go back to how things were? Or do we now see this as an opportunity to reinvent ourselves and create a new normal? Today's conference explores what we need to do differently in a post-pandemic world. The various speakers you'll hear from approach the theme from different perspectives, including sociological, psychological, and pedagogical. So we hope you enjoy the show and leave with food for thought. I'd now like to share with you a short video called It's Time for TED by John Boswell. And then it's on with the show. Thank you and welcome once again. Wonder, wonder, insight, insight. Ideas. ideas. It's time to tear. We can change the world if we defy the impossible. We have the tools, we have the passion. We, have the passion. we can be more, we can be much more. Let's turn the world inside out. It's just the beginning. We have achieved remarkable things. We can be more, we can be much more. Science is clever, science is clever. The great creativity is more magical. And now we need that magic. The miracle of your mind is that you can see the world as it isn't. We can imagine the future. We can remember the past. The miracle of your mind is that you can see the world as it isn't. We can imagine what it's like to be some other person in some other place. Some other place. Take a moment, take a breath. Uh, 
I'm a believer. The science is clear. We have to give all of all. We owe it. We owe it to our children and grandchildren. I'm a believer. We can't just drill our way out. We can't just bomb our way out. We're gonna invent our way out. Working together. Working together. We need to think big. We need to think cheap. We need to think about the problem differently. Wonder. Insight. Ideas. It's time to tell. Can you imagine what it's like to be some other person in some other place? Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes. Hold on. The city of the future calls on you to see it through. Will you dream with me? Will you dream with me? Will you build with me? Will you build with me? We have the tools. We have the passion. We, the passion. we can be more. We can be much more. I'm a believer. We can change the world if we defy the impossible. We have three billion new minds coming online to do that which we must do. To do that which we must do. We need to think big. We need to think cheap. We need to think about the problem differently. Wonder, insight, ideas. It's time to test. The miracle of your mind is so that you can see the world as it isn't. We can imagine the future. We can remember the past. The miracle of your mind is so that you can see the world as it isn't. Wonder, insight, ideas. It's time to test. Our first speaker today is Isla Peterswain. Isla is a student in Year 12 at the Academy. She's someone eager to share her love and passion for the performing arts. She's aspiring to pursue a career within the dramatic arts as she believes that creativity and imagination are essential for young individuals to grow in the futuristic world. Throughout her eight years studying in GEMS schools and taking part in various GEMS music academies and dramatic arts events, she has acquired an understanding of the importance of sharing the skills learned through the art of performing. Her talk this evening is titled The Performing Arts and the Engineer of the Imagination, in which she emphasises the importance of performing arts in a post-pandemic world. Please welcome Isla Peter Swain. Imagine a world where possibilities are endless. Imagine a world where you can be anything you want to be. The performing arts allows us to do just that. Away from the current stresses and anxieties of the global pandemic, the performing arts allows us to live alongside this pandemic in a manageable and cohesive way. They essentially allow us to learn how we learn. Now, as stated by Jackson, I am drawing my attention to the unique ways in which children view themselves and the world around them, and how those perceptions develop in response to the changing worlds of home and school. See, the curiosity that children possess allows a sense of wonder, openness, and directness, whereas some adults have succumbed to the conventions of life. So stopping a child from accessing their personal learning resources potentially harms them from bridging the familiar with the unfamiliar. It is even more important nowadays that during the current stark reality, children are able to make believe. I mean, we don't know what the world will look like in 20 or 30 years from now. Therefore, creativity, imagination, and the ability to explore different possibilities that do not currently exist are essential. The performing arts supports learning by leveraging children's curiosity through make believe and role play. They build grit and resilience. And it is these attributes that will be beneficial and valued in the jobs and roles that do not currently exist today. Now, the performing arts is the study of human behaviors and the way in which we connect with people, or connect with an environment around us. They help us to understand and refine our communication skills. 
And this allows an individual to harness them in all kinds of situations. So for instance, a child wants to become an astronaut, but they cannot experience this. However, they can explore this role through the world of the imaginary. The creative arts encourage us to connect with and understand our inter and intercommunication skills in the moment whilst events are unfolding. And I believe that this is one of the most valuable types of learning as it supports in the moment learning. Not only does the performing arts allow one to connect with and understand their communication skills, but they are also the development of speech and language. And this allows an individual to explore different areas of literacy. These skills acquired allow one to create a sense of imagination, and this can be applied to real life situations and scenarios. So for instance, um, performers create different visions um, for the performance. So for instance, a child wants to become an astronaut, as I've said previously. They can do this through um, speech and language and development. So the current positioning of the arts is something that frightens me and would do drama educators, composers, artists, or anyone out there who truly values the art of being and the art of connection. The performing arts are said to be systematically removed from the education system. Schools across the UK have noticed dramatic falls in children pursuing the art subjects in their GCSE or A-level subjects by 25%. See, I believe that these statistics are alarming as a society requires collaboration, communication, critical thinking and skills of reflection as our world becomes more futuristic. Now let's take Singapore as an example. Singapore has one of the highest PISA ratings in the world. But well, several years ago today, the Ministry of Education decided that the education system needed reform. Why? Because while Singapore produces great lawyers and doctors, there are no scientists, engineers, artists, or entrepreneurs. Exactly, this is a big problem. The very traditional test-based system didn't allow creativity or collaboration. I know because I was a product of that system. However, now the Singapore government has realized the importance of a holistic education that does include the performing arts. And as I've said previously, this is even more important during the current landscape we find ourselves in. So as we become only steps closer to a world of futuristic learning and AI technologies, we must adapt to these new methods of thinking by creating and accepting an abundant mindset. See, ever since I was a child, my parents always encouraged me to look at the world from a different perspective, a world where children and young people are influenced and driven by creativity and imagination, a world where subjects such as the performing arts allow an individual to truly succumb to the age of the imagination. Now, without this guidance, I wouldn't be standing here today. So I will continue to live with the knowledge that the arts are not only a subject, but a way of being and a way, the art of human connection. They are the fabric of our everyday lives and transform and create who we are and what we do. Thank you. Our second speaker is Dorsa Ismaili. Dorsa is a student in year 12 at the Academy. She loves history and English literature. She's been a part of the model UN here at the Academy. Her strong views on feminism and advocating for equal rights has led her to want to pursue a career in law as a prosecutor in the future. As a member of the charity committee and a seat in the prefect here at the Academy, Dorsa is someone who loves to bring change at the Academy. Her talk today is titled, Educate Women and Save the World in which she highlights the importance of women's education as a way to alleviate poverty, improve the global economy, and solve many challenges facing our world. Please welcome Dorsa Esmoli. mind if I have to sit on the floor at school. All I want is education, and I'm afraid of no one. These were some of the wise words of Malala Yousafzai. 
a renowned Pakistani activist for female education. One of the key obstacles women face is a lack of education. In many countries, education is only granted to men, denying women the right to knowledge and leaving them in the continuing cycle of mistreatment, violence, and poverty. What if we all had this great amount of passion for education? What would it feel like to truly want something that we already have access to? Something so simple, yet so powerful. Education. Now imagine yourselves in the shoes of someone such as Malala, being targeted and shot just because you were advocating for female education in your area. I know that I would not be standing on the stage speaking about this topic out of fear for my life and safety. Many of us would have been illiterate if we were young women living within Afghanistan. UNICEF has stated that around the world, a total of 132 million girls are out of school. These numbers and statistics should not be ignored. They shouldn't just be seen as another number or statistic. We cannot keep turning a blind eye towards women and young girls not having access to education as it plays a great role in our lives. I can vividly recall a time from my childhood where my grandmother in Iran spoke to me about how she was forced to drop out of school due to the social and political issues which were occurring in her country during her time. Instead, she received schooling from home but later dropped her studies altogether at a very young age. It has been discovered through extensive research that there is a positive correlation between gender equality and the amount of economic and social development of a country. It has been acknowledged by many governments and organizations that by reducing gender inequalities, we could be combating much bigger issues such as poverty, some studies have found that as a result of achieving gender equality for the education of women and young girls, there will be an enhancement of productivity and economic growth. Additionally, women obtaining knowledge and health has aided in decreasing infant mortality rates. Children who are born to educated mothers are 50% more likely to survive past the age of five. The global increase in women's education has prevented more than four million child deaths. Some countries end up losing more than $1 billion yearly by failing to educate girls on the same level as they educate boys. Luckily, we're seeing a positive change. Between the years 2000 and 2018, the number of out-of-school schoolgirls fell from 57 million to 32 million. These positive outcomes aid in improving the quality of life for women and young girls everywhere. As we move into a post-pandemic world, we should continue these positive efforts to promote the education of women and young girls all around the world. The long-term goal of reducing poverty and overpopulation will be impossible until we free women around the world from the enslavement of ignorance. More fundamental is that education is a basic human right which has systematically been denied to many women for too long. As Malala once said, every girl, no matter where she lives, no matter her circumstance, has the right to learn. Our next speaker is Mr. Ben Cooper who's the primary principal here at the Academy, author of waggleteaching.com, a teaching and learning blog and vlog. Mr. Cooper is passionate about teaching and learning, innovation and professional development. He focuses his work on improving the smallest aspects of teaching in order to have the biggest impacts on learning. Ms. Cooper's talk is titled Marginal Gains, the Microlearning for Teachers, in which she focuses on how the theory of marginal gains and the emerging microlearning culture could revolutionise professional development in the future. Please welcome Mr. Ben Cooper. Uh, 
at first, I wasn't really sure what I was doing. I wasn't even really sure why I was doing it. I was unconsciously incompetent. Now, I want to take you back in time to when we were all babies. In those first few weeks and months on this planet, we don't know what walking is. We've never acknowledged that people walk. We are unconsciously incompetent. And that's the first stage of learning. And then after a few more weeks and months, we suddenly realize, oh, people walk. And then we realize that we can't walk. And that can be quite frustrating. But we become consciously incompetent at walking. And after some falling over and getting back up again, and then falling over and getting back up again, we suddenly learn how to walk. We become consciously competent. But we have to think about it. And you can see in those first few uh, attempts at walking, when a child's clinging on to a table, they look at you as if to say, I'm going to walk now. And so they do, a little bit at first. They walk from one table to the ne next. And after some more time, we just, you know, walk. We even do other things while we're walking. We become unconsciously competent at walking. Now, unfortunately, when I was 22 years old, I was a newly qualified teacher. I had my first ever teaching job. And in those first few weeks and months, I was unconsciously incompetent as a teacher. And there's no worse place to be than not knowing what you don't know. In fact, what I've come to realize now, many years on, reflecting on those first few weeks and months, I was completely winging the whole thing, completely making it up. Now, don't get me wrong, I wasn't a terrible teacher. I worked really, really hard. I had great relationships with staff members, great relationships with the students. I was meeting all my deadlines. I was planning. I was teaching to the best of my ability. I was trying really, really hard. But I was not really having the impact that I wanted to. And then I slowly started to realize that there were teachers in other classrooms that were doing a better job than I was. I suddenly became consciously incompetent. And that's the worst place to be. The sudden realization that you're not doing the best job you can and that there's other people doing a better job than you are. Now, I went to university and I studied four years as a teacher. But university didn't really necessarily inspire me or prepare me for actually being a teacher. I had developed routines and set expectations in other people's classrooms. Nothing had prepared me to do that in my own. And I found university also a little bit contradictory. I had a great time and I did learn a lot about education. But in terms of actually teaching, I found it a bit of a contradictory process because we'd, we'd all turn up to lectures and we would um, sit down and the lecturer would talk to us about how to be a creative teacher and how to personalize the learning for every single child in that class to really inspire the individual. And they would do that through the medium of a two hour PowerPoint presentation to all 250 teachers in that lecture theater. So I came out of university with kind of knowledge on education but not really prepared to be a teacher. Except here I was at 22 years old in my first school in front of 38-year-olds being consciously incompetent. Now, I was very lucky because I had a primary leadership team that supported me greatly, and they introduced me to the idea of marginal gains. This is Sir Dave Brailsford, and he is the former head of the British cycling team. And he talked about the idea of marginal gains. He led the British cycling team to Olympic medals, Olympic gold medals, world championship glory. What he talked about was that he took cycling and he split it into lots of little bits. And he would improve each little bit by 1%. And by the time you've improved all these different parts by 1%, the actual impact would be far greater. So he would tweak the wheels 
on the bikes. He would make the bikes slightly lighter by shaving parts off the bike. He would tweak the diets and the training programs for the athletes. And he even went as far as making sure that each athlete slept on a consistent pillow every single night. And sure enough, over time, he led the British cycling team to Olympic and World Championship glory. Now, my leadership team believed that to be the same in teaching because teaching and learning can be extremely complicated. And what I've come to realize now is that most teachers at some point in those early years of being a teacher, in fact, most teachers throughout their career at some point will feel consciously incompetent. But if you take teaching and learning, which is quite a big concept, and break it down into tiny little bits and improve each one step at a time, then over a period of improvement, you'll improve your teacher practice quite dramatically. And so that's what I decided to do. I worked with my leadership team. I took small aspects of my teaching, made them better, and then moved on to the next one. I would look at how to get the children to stand up and line up in a straight line ready for assembly. I would then think about how I got the children back from playtime into a classroom, calmly ready to learn. I would think about how I asked questions in a classroom to engage the students in a more effective way. And sure enough, I started to feel like I was making a bit of progress. Now, at the same time, I decided to write a blog about it. I decided to write my kind of journey as a teacher and the things that I was trialing and the things that I felt were working. I also discovered things like Twitter, YouTube, and other social media websites where I found that there were other teachers like me who were trialing small things and sharing these small, tiny tips, these marginal gains with the world. And so I would take their ideas and apply it to my classroom, and I would share my ideas on social media and through my blogs that I was writing. And again, slowly, I felt like I was getting somewhere. Now, it wasn't until maybe 10 years later that something, everything that I was doing started to make a bit more sense. I bumped into a person who was actually a, a fan of my blog, and they said, I really think your blog's brilliant. It's a really great example of micro-learning. I had no idea what he was talking about. I had no idea what micro-learning was. So I did what any teacher does when somebody comes to you and says something that you don't understand. You smile, you nod, you pretend you know exactly what they're talking about, and then you go straight home and Google it. And so that's what I did. I Googled micro-learning. Micro-learning is uh, the idea. It's a, um, a skills learning focused approach. And what it is, it takes a skill and breaks it down into small chunks. And you just learn those for maybe 10 to 20 minutes a day. And sure enough, one piece of micro-learning feels quite small. But over time, it gets much bigger. And the skill that you're working on gets better. And that's what I found with my teaching. I was slowly starting to make progress. In fact, there was even some moments when I started to feel like I was becoming consciously competent in some aspects of my teaching. And what I've kind of come to realize now is that teaching at its basic level is relatively straightforward. All we really need to do as teachers is help students get better at stuff. And the best way to get better at stuff is to break that stuff down into smaller little bits of stuff and feed it slowly to the students over a period of time, make it more digestible. But for some reason, teaching as a general practice has been overcomplicated. It's been made really difficult or feel really difficult and overwhelming. And we also have overcomplicated the idea of getting better at teaching. Because if we really are just taking the idea of getting better at stuff and breaking it down to make it easier to get better at stuff, then that's really what we need to start doing with teaching. We overcomplicate getting better at teaching stuff. One piece of research that I've been engaging with quite recently is the science of learning. And the science of learning cuts away all the other things to do with education and just focuses on the brain and how the brain learns best. And many teachers are adopting neuroscience research that's been converted into digestible aspects of teaching 
and applying those digestible aspects of teaching into the classroom. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in the spirit of micro learning, I thought I would introduce you to my seven research informed tips for how to take the science of learning and apply it into the classroom. Tip number one, students will probably remember the first 10 to 20 minutes of a lesson the most. And tip number two, students need to ensure that they've been provided with opportunities for retrieval practice and practical learning in order to take that learning and embed it into their long-term memory. Tip number three, students must ensure that they understand that effort, choice and ownership of their learning matter the most. Tip number four, Students need to be provided with frequent, low stakes, stress-free formative assessments in order to track the learning process. Tip number five, students need to be reflective. Tip number six, well-being, diet, nutrition, exercise, sleep, all play a significant factor in the learning process. Now the science of learning, oh, tip number seven, Tip number seven, the students need to know the previous six rules. And the science of learning has got me thinking because this research is all about how students learn best, except it's not. It's how brains learn best. And teachers have brains too. So we can also apply these rules to teachers and professional development. So in the spirit of micro learning, I'm going to reintroduce you to these uh, rules but by replacing students with teacher and professional development. Tip number one, teachers will probably remember the first 10 to 20 minutes of a professional development session the most. Tip number two, teachers need opportunities for retrieval practice and practical learning in order to take that professional development and embed it in their long-term memory. They need to give things a go. Tip number three, teachers need, must remember the effort choice and ownership of their professional development matter the most. Tip number four, teachers need to be provided with frequent, low stakes, stress-free observations or assessments in order to help track their progress, not necessarily stressful formal lesson observations. Tip number five, teachers need to be reflective. T tip number six, teachers need uh, well-being and um, exercise and nutrition and diet and sleep all play a significant factor in a teacher's performance. And tip number seven, teachers benefit from knowing these rules. When I first started as a teacher, I was unconsciously incompetent. And then quite quickly, I realized I wasn't doing a very good job. I became consciously incompetent. But through giving things a go, looking after myself, assessing and reviewing and being reflective quite frequently, including by writing my blogs and reflecting on what I was doing in the classroom, by taking that micro learning and focusing on marginal gains, I felt like I was getting better. In fact, as I said, I was slowly becoming consciously competent. And in fact, there were even aspects of my teaching where they were starting to become habits. I was slowly and certain aspects of my teaching were becoming unconsciously competent, or as I like to talk, let, talk about, teaching a little bit like a ninja. Now, at first I wasn't really sure what I was doing and I applied, and accidentally so, I was applying the science of learning and micro learning and marginal gains to my own professional development. I just didn't know that that was what I was doing when I started. Next, we have Adriana Santos. Adriana is a year 10 student at the academy. She's passionate about dance, as has been dancing ever since she was four years old. In the future, she wants to study medicine in college. She's really interested in people and how they live, which has led her to talk about mental health and to be in the Human Rights Committee in Junior Model UN. Adriana's talk is titled Mental Health for a Saner World, in which she focuses on acknowledging the importance of mental health and psychological well-being of students. 
Please put your hands together for Adriana Santos. Around 400,000 people are murdered every year. However, according to the World Health Organization, every year, twice that amount of people commit suicide. Globally, one person commits suicide every 40 seconds. During the brief introduction that I've made, one person has taken their life. And by the end of my talk, 10 more people will have taken their own lives. We live in a world today where people are so mentally troubled that they believe the only way they have to escape is by taking their own life. World Health Organization says that one out of four people will be affected by a mental or neurological disorder at some point of their life. However, not everyone will get the help they need. According to the National Alliance on Mental Health, only 40% of adults and 50% of youth get the medical help and care they deserve. Even though mental illness is such a common thing, and can affect anyone, there's still a great stigma attached to it. And this stigma creates fear and shame in asking for help. During the lockdown, people were confined at home for months on end, many of them without their loved ones around. Adding to this the fear of catching COVID-19 and not being able to get the help needed has only created more problems. As students, we have been put under so much stress from very early ages. For example, when we get our exam dates, we start studying for them, and we stress out about whether we revise everything we had to or if we're missing anything. Then, the actual exam date comes, we go into the exam hall, and our minds go completely blank. Waiting for results to come out just adds up to the built-up anxiety. I think I can talk for most students and teachers that the cancellation of GCSEs and A-levels has only made us all panic and stress out about everything. This is not healthy. We are only kids. Personally, I've always been really anxious about achieving the things my parents and teachers believe I should be able to achieve. And frankly, that has left me in a place where the night before exams I can barely sleep, and when I have to do homework, I stress out about whether I did it well enough to please my teachers or not. The question is, how do we fix and address the issue of mental health? And of course, I'm not talking about clinical issues, to which we need a combination of professional help, medication, and lifestyle change to fix. I'm talking about the low-grade kind of mental anxiety and distress that most of us teenagers feel. The UK's Mental Health Foundation recommends that we keep active, eat well, drink sensibly, and do something that we're good at. For me, that's dancing, which is my escape. The National Alliance of Mental Health has found these common warning signs that we can be vigilant of. Some of these signs include oversleeping or exhaustion, loss of engagement, wearing long pants, sleeves, or band-aids to cover up signs of self-harm. The most important thing is to be supportive, not enabling. When and if a friend comes to you about their issues, be patient, and above all, listen. When talking to someone who's struggling, it's important to be mindful about the things that we say. Sentences like, everything's going to be okay, or you'll get over it. Do nothing to help someone with a mental health disorder. Instead, ask questions like, how can I help you right now? Reassure them that they're not the only ones that go through these issues, and that you'll be by their side through it all. Also saying, you're being overdramatic, or stop making such a big deal out of such a small thing, is only going to make them feel worse about themselves. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused widespread death, and the silver lining is that more and more schools and workplaces are being mindful and taking into account their students' and staff's well-being. If you feel like you've experienced any of the things that I've talked about today, don't be afraid to seek for help. I know it can be hard to share your issues with anyone, but you need to remember that the people who surround you are the people who love you the most and who want to see you happy. There are many people that you can talk to, your family, your friends, your teachers, your school counselor. Everyone wants you to be the happiest you can be. So speak up, help someone help you.
We're almost at the end of the first half of the conference. We'll take a short five minute comfort break after our next speaker, who is Sadie Hallam. Sadie is a year 10 student at the academy. She has a passion for netball and animals. Her aspirations for the future are to study medicine in the UK with the hope of working with the air ambulance as a doctor. She believes that everyone in the world should love who they are because nobody can change themselves, which is what led to her topic of her speech this evening. Sadie's talk is titled, If Our Bodies Could Talk, in which she considers the impact of social media on our sense of self and how we can develop a more body positive image of ourselves and be less judgmental of others. Please give a warm welcome to Sadie Hallam. Today we exist in a world that if we don't like something, we can change it. If someone else doesn't like something, we will change it. We exist in a world where feeling happy about ourselves isn't enough. And we're forever pleasing others before we even try to please ourselves. And that's wrong. How many times have you stood in front of the mirror and told yourself that you're amazing, you're wonderful, and the best version of you to ever exist? I can imagine it's not very often, or perhaps never. In fact, only 4% of women class themselves as beautiful. Now, I can tell you every single person in this room is beautiful. Beauty is the qualities that we hold, such as shape and color, that pleases the aesthetic senses. But it's not only this. It's also the journeys that we've been on and the stories that we've told. As a society today, we spend ages trying to promote this concept of body image. But by calling our bodies images, we're objectifying ourselves. And no wonder why we can't feel good about who we are. Our bodies are the stories of our lives. How we dress shows who we are, how we act shows who we are, and even the way we talk shows who we are. Now the way we act and talk can't be seen in one single image, but these can be seen in a journey or a story. We've all been walking through the street and said, oh look, so-and-so is really beautiful. And get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with this. But we've also compared ourselves to this so-called beautiful person. Who are we to predetermine if they're truly beautiful without knowing them, without knowing their story? Consistently during our lives, we use words like pretty, attractive, cute, and fit. But what do these words really mean? and how do they affect our confidence? Words like pretty and attractive are used in the same context most of the time, but these have got completely different meanings. Attractive means to be appealing to look at, and pretty means to be an attractive in a delicate way without being truly beautiful. Now, many women feel being called pretty is a compliment, but think, it's also confirming these stereotypes that women should be sophisticated, mature, and act like young ladies. Whereas many men feel being called pretty is an insult, the same goes for cute and fit. As a society, we've changed the meanings of, words, of the words to what we want them to be, and everyone around has just gone with the flow. What do you think cute means? Does it mean to be a little fluffy teddy bear? Or does it mean to be good looking? It actually means to be good looking. Now, many men feel being called cute is an insult, but it's someone just calling them good looking. And as a world, we need to look back on these real definitions of the words we're using because what you might perceive as compliment, someone else might not. Social media is a huge part of our lives. We've all scrolled through and seen that one girl or maybe boy that we wanted to look like, but what makes them so special that makes us really want to be them? Is it because they've got nice hair, a nice nose and a flat stomach? Or is it because they're filled with love and generosity inside? Now, social media is great at creating fake stories that make people want to change. It's also great at creating unrealistic expectations for society to follow. It's allowing us to live the life we want to live, not the life we're living. We're all at some point guilty of editing a photo to show off the people who we want to be, right? When, this is because when we're about to post something, there's a so-called success criteria the photo should follow. 
I can't post this, I don't look skinny enough, my hair doesn't look nice enough, I don't look tanned enough. But why are we scared to show off who we are? So the power of social media today is allowing us to hide behind the screens of our phones with the, without the fear of being judged or harassed for the people who truly are. It's proven that people who post more about themselves are more insecure than someone is, who isn't, so they can get the satisfaction from others they maybe need to feel good about themselves. But we shouldn't need someone else to tell us this. If someone else can tell us that we look great in a picture, then there's no reason why we can't tell ourselves first. Since the beginning of 2020, the world we live in has become a completely different planet. Masks are now a necessity to our outfits, and sanitizer is a must-have in our bags. But how has this pandemic affected the way that we all view ourselves? Like me, many of us have been locked up in our houses and able to do the things that we love, so instead we've sat on our couches instead of our phones. People have said that during the pandemic, their social media consumption has risen to 72%. And along with this rise, their expectations have also risen. But not only this, people have had the time to find the flaws and insecurities that they don't like about themselves. But this isn't everyone. Some people have also used this time to find the things that they love about themselves and the things that they truly love to do. Throughout life, there are specific stereotypes that associate one with their body. But someone shouldn't be determined on what they can do just because they look a certain way. I'm I can almost guarantee that everyone in this room at some point has been subjectified to name calling. This is myself included. Now, I'm not one of the smallest people alive. I'm bigger than some class average. But who told me what average is? Each time I get called a horrible word, I turn it into something positive. I mean, yeah, of course it bothers me, but there are millions of people out there who think I'm beautiful. And there's one person who thinks they can be mean and mock me. I'm a keen sportswoman. I play netball, dance, swimming, athletics, football, cheerleading, and the list goes on. But looking at me, you probably think I don't. Does me being big mean I warranty weird looks when I tell people that I enjoy to play sports? I've also had people seem shocked when I say I eat salads. In fact, salads are one of my favorite meals. But again, does me being big mean I can only like chocolate, donuts, and McDonald's? This is what bothers me. Why does one have to determine what another can do just because they look different to themselves? Why am I supposedly not allowed to, put, to wear tight clothes? Is it because I don't have a flat stomach and I've got rolls? Well, what's the point of clothes will be in different sizes? Now, I'm a very confident person, but some people might find my confidence as me trying to hide who I am. But I'm just confident. I'm big and I'm beautiful. I love who I am and we should all love who we are. If everyone were the same in the world we live in, it would be a very boring place. So let's all show off our beauties, whether it's our hair, heart, color, or even the freckles on our faces. Let's all embrace who we are because there's only one of you out there today, and that's the one here. There is hope and people will have already started, but remember, beauty is a thing that's internal and external. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now take a short five-minute comfort break. The washrooms are located at the back of the auditorium. Please don't go too far away. We'll restart promptly in five minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. 
it's time for our final five speakers of this evening. Up next is Salma Halal. Salma is a year 12 student at the academy who is passionate about design and innovation, aspiring to become an architect, blending both modern, cultural, and sustainable building styles. She was recently elected to be head girl, starting in the new academic year. Salma's talk is titled Without a Filter, in which she focuses on the lessons that the wider world can learn from the Syrian conflict. Please welcome Salma Halal. Refugee. Unfortunately, this is the way most people view us Syrians. The media has the power to change the views of a whole generation. It hides many untold stories and shines the lights on others. If you go now and Google the word Syrians, this is what you'll find. The miserable side of us. Those who immigrated or fled and never know anything about their homes or families. The people who lack access to simple life essentials, water, food, electricity, and a home. We never get to see the positive side. I'm not saying that it's all sunshine and rainbows, but there's definitely those people who worked hard and proved themselves. According to the UNICEF, the national enrollment percentage in Syria has decreased to 56% from 2010 to 2014. And this is all due to the harsh conditions and school destructions all over the country. But many people took their children and helped them find better opportunities. Take, for example, Nur Leith Ibrahim, who won a first place in a mental math competition in Malaysia. Tariq Haddad, who rebuilt with his family his father's chocolate factory in Canada. And their business was once presented in one of Justin Trudeau's past speeches. And finally, one of my favorites, Amr Maskoun, who immigrated aged 14 and is now one of the Levant's biggest social media influencers. I was one of the people who lived in the war for about five years. After the conditions got really bad in Aleppo in 2016, we decided to leave. We came here to Dubai, a whole other world, where I stood in front of my teachers, not understanding their language or accent. I felt like I was lost and I was misunderstood. My English was quite basic and my communication skills were zero. In a matter of months, with the help and support of my family, teachers, and new friends, I was able to overcome this obstacle. And here I am, standing here in front of you, speaking with what I call fluent English. If my 12-year-old self saw me right now, she would be speechless. She wouldn't believe the fact that she became that person standing here today, presenting her country and making her people proud. What we see all over the media is not always the real image. Everyone has their untold story that has brought them to where they are right now. What you see when Googling Syrians is the result of what the war has done to us. It's not who we really are. Living in the war, I've always seen a lot of children walk to school together, play together, enjoy their time together. But there was also these kids, the ones that you see in the news every day, who were not fortunate enough to have the life that I or anyone around me had. They were instead forced to flee their homes, give up their education, lose their families, live in camps, and work without enjoying their childhood. Obviously, most media platforms step in, sending their photographers and taking pictures of these poor children instead of helping them. This should be stopped. Using that side of Syrians as a standard is cruel. Thousands of us are fighting every day to make our country stand back up, to, make, to give our people the normal life again, and to give our children their childhood that they are losing. This side should be given more attention. This is why we should remove all the filters that are hiding everyone's real story and learn why people ended up like this. We're a nationality known for our hard work and ambitions, and everyone has a factor that is limiting their ability to become the best they can. For us, it was war. War was what limited many of our aspirations. An opportunity is what many of our children are lacking. Giving those children a small opportunity will change their life. It will be their road to success, just like Noor, Amr, Tare, and me. A small opportunity gave us 
a, a much better life, and it was our own success. We should learn how to be more positive and optimistic. Remove all these stereotypical ideologies and help each other up instead of letting each other down. Syrians and many other nationalities prove to the world that no matter how hard the conditions we've been through, we seize the opportunities that we were given without any excuses. We need to learn how to be more empathetic. We need to learn how to provide more opportunities to the unfortunate. And we need to learn how to see our world without a filter. We'd like to welcome our next speaker, Yusuf Raskeller. Yusuf is a student in Year 13 at the Academy. He's an entrepreneur and is passionate about exponential technology, innovation, and the future. Yusuf is the vice head boy of the Academy. He has two companies, one called Sahi, that is related to health and nutrition, and the other is the clothing line called Unwritten Lines. He's very passionate about innovation in the health sector as well as education. Yusuf's talk is titled Healthcare versus Defense. We invested in the wrong fight, in which he considers the importance of healthcare over weapons and the need to prepare for a war against disease instead of a war against fellow humans. Please give a warm welcome to Yusuf Rezkeller. COVID-19 has hit our economy, politics, morals, and values in a completely unique way. It has compelled us to innovate in new and exciting ways. There have been many positive outcomes from the coronavirus. However, if there's one thing that we've learned is that we spend far too much money on nuclear warfare and weapons, and nearly not enough on healthcare. The main reason the pandemic hit us so hard is because we see other nations as being the major threat. However, we see an increase in threat from viruses and bacteria as well. The mismatch between what we spend on nuclear warfare and what we spent on the military is stark. In 2020, the year of the pandemic, the world has spent over $2 trillion on its military. That's a ridiculous and obscene amount of money. Most of these bombs sit in silos and are kept in buildings to never be used again. Did you know that the US spends more on its military budget annually than NASA spent over the past 60 years. The U.S. close to $1 trillion on its military per year. Allow me to elaborate how much $1 trillion really is. So, if you counted one number per second, it would take you 12 days to reach 1 million. 32 years to reach 1 billion. In other words, if you started counting from 1989, you'd reach 1 billion today. However, it would take you a whopping 32,000 years to count to one trillion. Imagine if we spent one trillion dollars on alleviating poverty. 30% of the people from my country are enslaved to the hands of poverty, especially after 2018, when the Egyptian government decided to increase military spendings by nearly 200%. Therefore, resulting in their weekly elderly income to fall below $10 a week. Who knows what happened to the less fortunate families across the land of the pharaohs? I believe the pandemic was one event that really helped open the human race's eyes on what should be prioritized for our species. What the human race needs to unlearn is the ridiculous amount of money we spent on weapons and must relearn to spend that on healthcare, education, and uplifting people out of poverty. The real threat in 2020 was from a virus. How much did we spend on healthcare last year? We should have been developing hospitals and field clinics in a war footing. We should have been investing in health companies and providing mass health insurance. 2020 should have taught us that life is full of uncertainties and is highly unpredictable. Instead of spending trillions of dollars on weapons, we could have been providing health care to countries that suffered a huge number of COVID cases. Those trillion dollars could have saved our fellow human beings. However, they were used on weapons designed to kill us. We've got to be spending far more on science, technology, and space exploration. By doing so, we could help reduce pollution, 
fight climate change, uplift people out of poverty, and expand human consciousness across the rest of the solar system. By exploring space, we could be closer than ever to stepping on Mars and sending human life there. Potentially, find other life beyond Earth due to, our due to an increase in exponential technology. There are millions of young entrepreneurs with big dreams and incredible solutions to some of the global grand challenges. Let us support these thinkers and invest in their ideas. I, myself an entrepreneur, would love to invest in areas such as medicine, space exploration, and nanotechnology. Overall, I believe by spending less on the military would mean far greater progress in areas such as medicine, as well as technology. Let us invest in these areas of human endeavor, rather than on bombs and fighter jets. Instead of an arms race, the world superpowers should invite in an innovation race and compete to make the world a healthier and happier place for the rest of mankind. Up next is Ms. Susanna Grace Johnson. Ms. Johnson is the counselor here at the Academy. She's a passionate well-being and mental health specialist with eight plus years of experience within UAE and India. She has a master's in clinical psychology and is keen on envisioning a future where mental health is top priority within all sectors of society. Her particular interests are in embedding practices from neuroscientific and positive psychology research into improving well-being in schools. She's also trained in narrative therapy, suicide prevention, grief, and trauma therapy. Her talk today is titled The End of an Era, Mental Health in Schools, in which she presents a futuristic vision on how educators can bring a transformational shift towards positive mental health and raise resilient adults for a better tomorrow. Please put your hands together for Susanna Johnson. As a clinical psychologist focused in schools, one of the most profound things I've heard a teenager ask me during a session is, Miss, do you know why life is fair? Following my visibly inquisitive silence, she replied, life is fair because it is unfair to everyone. Through the years, I've had the opportunity to closely interact with children from various cultural backgrounds, socioeconomic status, and I realize that these young adults truly live in a world that is quite different from their past generations. A world where the rules of social engagement have been so radically defined by technology and now the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic. The delivery of learning as we know it has witnessed a paradigm shift that academics and policymakers are now reconsidering the future of education. It is at this juncture I hope to turn your attention to a crucial aspect of a child's development, their mental health and well-being. There is an acute need to shift the way in which we deal with mental health in schools. A 2012 research by the World Health Organization stated that the following two decades would witness worldwide changes in the pattern of epidemiology of diseases. Today, as we stand at the halftime of this forecast, one can't help but notice the eerie accuracy of this study. So the question remains, how desperate are we to see change in the area of well-being? United Nations predicts that the post-pandemic world would see depression ranked number one in the global burden of diseases by 2030. The mortality rate of those with mental disorders is significantly higher than the general population, with a median life expectancy loss of 10.1 years. Mental health statistics prior to the pandemic were as depicted. To shed a little light into UAE statistics, 
anxiety disorders followed by substance abuse, depression, eating disorders, and schizophrenia were the top five mental health concerns affecting the younger population in 2019. The ominous trend is that mental disorders may replace communicable diseases as the leading factor in disability and premature death. Mental health and well-being is crucial to the sustainable development of this world, so much so that within the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the third one emphasizes on ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being at all ages. It is evident that the post-pandemic world truly marks the end of an era on how we have dealt with mental health in schools. It is here that I would like to highlight my vision on the new era that is dawning on our education system. One of my most favorite quotes by Aristotle states, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. So the question remains, how can schools make a difference? Learning is often embedded in emotional states. A confident, responsible, reflective, innovative, and engaged learner reasons and makes decisions based on their positive personal values and an understanding of their emotions. Schools can make a difference. And this is evident in the story of this young girl. This little girl was always running. We all know one of those kids, don't we? She was unable to sit through her lesson through kindergarten, perpetually lost through middle school, and depressed in high school. Her teachers, on the other hand, saw the real individual beyond this hyperactive and confused bubble. The bond that she shared with many of her teachers was, in fact, so strong that it allowed her to be believe that she was more than what she felt, her feelings or her ever-wandering thoughts. A timely conversation with her high school principal allowed her to decide on the right major, and she was eventually accepted into a degree in clinical psychology. During the course of her program, with the help of her professors, she was diagnosed with ADHD as a young adult. All her life experiences leading to this moment made complete sense. And this new discovery gave fresh meaning and purpose to her life. Well, it's a great story, one would think. But wouldn't it be better for you to know that this is actually my story? Today, I stand as a testimony to the things that I learned beyond my textbooks, through the deep and meaningful relationships I built with my teachers and later on my professors. I believe the confidence that I got through the trust instilled in me helped me to grow to, into the person that I am today. My story is yet another example of how the right form of nurture and teaching delivery can truly transform a young individual. And more often than not, it is the knowledge giver rather than the knowledge, in other words, the teacher rather than the textbook that can make all the difference and witness magic happen. One practical way to achieve this can be found in the concept of positive education. That models positive purpose. Purpose in life is essential for good health. Did you know that a sense of purposelessness makes us vulnerable to depression, risk-taking behaviors, somatic complaints, and poor social relationships. Positive purpose, on the other hand, is about understanding, believing, serving something greater than yourself, and deliberately engaging in activities for the benefit of others. The intrinsic value of contributing to others and the community provides a strong rationale for a focus on purpose within schools. And this pandemic has only made it even more necessary for this to be a core aspect of our humanity. In addition to feeling worthy, serving others, and having a sense that life is purposeful and meaningful contributes to our students' psychological and physical health. As schools, we can look at small changes that can generate miracles in the long run. If we imagine a future for our children, what would be the one thing you would wish for them? 
I'm sure you agree with me that we would aspire for a future that is happy, a world where our children are resilient and make a positive contribution to others. If we want our children to be calm and optimistic, we need to model that through our life and our choices. Notice what's good. A lot of past and current research have stated that humans are born with pro-social behaviors. As educators, we have the opportunity to model that to our students. We also understand the power of descriptive norms. If we describe our world as being more pro-social, such as being helpful, kind, more community-focused, we inspire those behaviors. We thus need to create pro-social ripples from a young age to ensure that we are contributing to a child's social and academic success. Our body is always anchored in the present moment, which is why most mindfulness practices begin by focusing on our body or our breath. Guiding students to help them being more mindful helps them regulate the chaos in their minds and focus on what, what is before them. I encourage each of us to be present and lead our young people to practice being in the present moment. Feeling scared, uneasy, worried, or even anxious about the current state of the world is quite understandable. Ignoring these emotions, however, would only make us feel them more strongly. It is therefore important that we acknowledge negative emotions. Curiously examine the emotion, allowing curiosity to combat the difficult and negative impact of difficult emotions is a practical and influential way through which we can guide our young people to deal and acknowledge such negative emotions. Yet another powerful tool to emotional well-being is being physically active and being as close to nature as possible. Engage with your environment as creatively as you can. We need to champion our young people to push their creative and physical limits in our pursuit of happiness. While it would be easy to bunker down or lock ourselves away indoors, get outside and be active. It is highly successful in combating stress or burnout. Creating healthy habits through school-related activities is a powerful way through which we can contribute to our students' psychological and physical well-being. In its most basic sense, the positive education model can be thought of as a roadmap for what we want for our students. Good health, frequent positive emotions, a sense of purpose and meaning, supportive relationships, the accomplishment of worthwhile goals, and moments of complete immersion and absorption. I envision a life where our young people use their character, character strengths to contribute to themselves and others. Well-being is in the heart of everything we do these days, especially in schools in the UAE. Even more encouraging is the fact that as part of the National Program for Well-being and Happiness, the UAE government aims to be the best in the Human Development Index and the happiest of all nations. However, it is time we graduate from conducting surveys, hosting talks on mental health awareness, or even hiring a school counselor or a well-being advisor to embedding well-being into the curriculum, teaching our young people on what to expect in the real world. This is a journey each of us must undertake. We are educators. We are born to do this. So let's get out there and start this new era right. I'm very inspired by the idea of the adjacent possible that Stephen Johnson wrote about in his book, Where Good Ideas Come From. And he says that the adjacent possible is like a shadow future that sort of hovers over the present state of things. The adjacent possible is like a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself.
I love this idea because it implies a kind of built-in optimism in how we see the world. It sort of implies a different way of looking at things that is not held back, that will not be back. I'm very inspired by the idea of the adjacent possible that Stephen Johnson wrote about in his book, Where Good Ideas Come From. And he says that the adjacent possible is like a shadow future that sort of hovers over the present state of things. The adjacent possible is like a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself. I love this idea because it implies a kind of built-in optimism in how we see the world. It sort of implies a different way of looking at things that is not held back, that will not be bound by what is, but that is always remixing, that is always reinventing, that is always looking at how we can transform the material properties of the present so that we can bring into being our virtual models, our imaginative visions, because that's what human beings do. Imagination allows us to conceive of these delightful future possibilities and then literally pull the present forward to meet it. And increasingly powerful technologies are shrinking the lag time between what we can imagine and what we can create. The adjacent possible is a move that is accelerating. Our adjacent possible is increasingly being able to be instantiated in real time. We're time lapsing our capacity to literally render our dreams into being. So for that reason, the adjacent possible rocks my imagination. We are approaching the end of our series of talks. Our next speaker is Zara abdul Ghaffar. Zara is a student in year 10 at the academy. She is passionate about biology and would like to study government in college. She's also a part of the charity committee where she has helped to lead many initiatives. She has been passionate about feminism from a young age, being brought up in a vocal household where standing up for what you believed in was encouraged. She is also a recipient of the Sheikha Fatima Award. The title of Zara's talk is Bridging the Leadership Divide, in which she considers how women are showing the world how to navigate global challenges with compassion and decisiveness. Please put your hands together for Zara Ghaffar. Women in the 21st century can help to lead the way. Forging a new path from the prevalent male-dominated society, we need more women in leadership. Now I know what you must be thinking. I know of many women in powerful leadership positions, and there's an even distribution between men and women. However, in December 2019, women held 36 of S&P 500 CEO positions. That is only 6%. That is not enough. While it's likely that the men on that list deserve their positions, I also know that women deserve to be there as well. Female leaders are unable to prove themselves to be shortlisted for these roles, and women in managerial positions often fear being undermined by their male counterparts when they are the authority figure. This isn't evident in every part of society, but it's still there, whether it's implicit or explicit. Women hold 56% of the global labor market. This shows a 56% showing systematic restrictions on female employees' abilities to move vertically in these companies. 
So let's look back at our history as modern industrialized communities and how have we viewed women in positions of power? At a glance, you'd expect the positions of women to be almost non-existent. However, when you delve into specific communities, you start to understand their importance. Here you have Mary Curie. She worked alongside her husband, Pierre, and they were 19th century, highly decorated chemists. She was able to show that women can work alongside men, but at the same time, she still had key characteristics such as determination and perseverance, which is key to any social change or business transformation. Forbes has reported that female leaders consistently take a broader view beyond economic control and more onto societal impact. This idea could come from the notion that female leaders have a softer touch or a maternal instinct that their male counterparts just lack. However, I believe that we should challenge the validity of these responses and not judge leadership skills based on gender identity, on male or female, rather on the individual's characteristics. The Harvard Business Review has reported on the glass cliff phenomenon, where female leaders are consistently put in a place of crisis when a firm is in trouble. They take on this role and they're tasked to do this because consistently before, during, and after a crisis, they have been shown to work better than their male counterparts. This is shown and is evident in Jacinda Ardern, the Vice President, sorry, Prime Minister of New Zealand. She's been able to show that you can put kindness at the forefront of your agenda. And with that, she's been able to tackle key roles and issues such as climate change and the pandemic. And arguably, she's been able to tackle these better than her male counterparts. She's proved to her peers and most importantly to her people that she is the person for the job. Another great example of this is Kamala Harris, the first female vice president of America. She's been able to diversify her political system, showing aspiring leaders coming next that you can do it just like her. And that's why looking to the future, I see it as being very, very bright. And I don't share the pessimistic view of it can only get worse from here because I believe it can only get better. We've seen this time and time again. So with the pandemic, we've seen exponential growth. Why can't we use that same momentum for this task as well? And because of that, women in the 21st century can help to lead the way. Our last speaker for this evening is Ms. Paula Finn. Ms. Finn is the primary vice principal here at the Academy. Originally from Scotland, she has taught with different curricula across a variety of schools, including rural schools, primary schools, special schools, and through schools. Her teaching experience spanning 13 years has ranged from the early years through to inclusion support in the secondary school. She is particularly interested in how children acquire language over time and how they develop their literacy skills across all phases of the school. Her talk is titled Learning to Read During a Global Pandemic, in which she considers how the pandemic has forced teachers to innovate practice in many ways and how these changes will inform teaching and learning in the future. Please welcome to the stage our final speaker of the evening, Miss Paula Finn. <laughs> This is me.
1986 in a primary school in central Scotland. I remembered that I was in the red group for reading and much like many other children, you figure out very quickly um, where you rank within the ability groups in the classroom. And I realized that I wasn't in the top reading group. And I remember feeling quite negative about that. I was, however, in the top maths group. And I felt sorry for the other children that weren't in that group. I remember thinking, why didn't they just get maths the way that I did? Ability grouping has been used for a long time by teachers to narrow the range of differentiation in the classroom. So teachers would usually work with a small group of students around tables or an area in the classroom, and they would work with each group one at a time. One thing to note here is that I'm not very comfortable as a teacher with the word ability, but for the purpose of this talk, what I'm referring to is a child's current ability in their learning, not about a notion of fixed ability or IQ or about what children might be able to do in the future. As a teacher back in Scotland, I always used ability groups to teach the children in maths and in English because I saw it as the most effective way to cover all of the needs in my classroom. I would always start at the beginning of the year with three reading groups, but by the end of the year, I felt as though I could have had five or six reading groups. And at some points, I felt as though I could have planned an individual lesson for every single child in that class, but that would have been ridiculous. Why did I always feel that way? And I think it's because regardless of being placed in an ability group, children will always have their own personal, unique next steps in learning. In the world of education, there has been a long-standing debate around whether we should use ability groups to teach reading or whether we should use a whole class approach. Advocates of ability, of ability groups would tell you that children are catered for because they're working within a group where they can access the text. Um, the learning is sort of targeted to their level. And advocates of whole class um, reading would tell you that even the children who are lower ability readers are brought on because um, they're having access to higher sort of expectations, um, more complex language within those texts. Teachers who are wary of um, whole class reading would worry about the children who perhaps can't access that text. How is that making them feel if they're not able to read the text that's being used in a whole class lesson? Teachers who are wary of ability groups would question, as a teacher, when you're working with that one group, what are the rest of your students doing? I know that when I used ability groups to teach reading, I would give those students um, other tasks like spelling, handwriting, and usually some follow-up reading activities, things like creating a character study, uh, maybe writing a blurb for the book, maybe creating the front cover, and lots of other activities. But if I'm really honest with myself, I don't know if all of those activities really develop the children as readers. My school is currently working towards high performance learning accreditation and high performance learning is a philosophy developed by Deborah Ayer, which sees all students as high, high performers, regardless of their ability. All children or most children will get there in time, given the opportunities and support and over time. When I first arrived in Dubai in 2013, I remember going to observe a maths lesson. And at the beginning of the lesson, the teacher got all the students together and she taught maths to the whole class. And I remember thinking at the beginning of that lesson, where is the differentiation? How is this teacher going to cater for the needs of all of the different children in the classroom when she's teaching all of them together? And I realized very quickly that 
The teacher had created um, differentiated follow-up activities for the children, and she used the traffic light system to do that. So the green activities um, allowed children to have independent learning that was at an entry level, and the amber activities at a mid-level, and the red activities were the most challenging in the classroom. And I remember that I knew some of the children in that class, and some of the children that I knew to be the lower ability attainers actually really surprised myself and the teacher by um, starting off at entry level challenges, but then progressing quite quickly onto more complex activities. Equally, some children that I knew to be high attaining learners felt that they needed a little bit more confidence and they would start at entry level challenges and very quickly progress onto more complex challenges. Over the last five years, we have used this approach um, particularly to teach maths in my school, and I've found it to be quite effective. Since we started this, the traffic lights have become chilly challenges, but the philosophy remains the same. All children have access to all learning, and then the differentiation comes in in their ind independent follow-up activities. In my school, we use whole class reading approaches from year three onwards. In the foundation stage or reception year in the UK and key stage one, we use a well-known um, synthetic systematic uh, phonics program. And for that phonics program, which involves um, phonics practice, reading and writing, we do set the children. So we group them into ability groups until the pandemic. In Dubai, our children came back to school in September 2020 after um, global school closures. And the teachers had to learn very quickly how to um, innovate their practice. We had some students who were still online, so we had to work out how to include them in the lesson. And the children that we had in front of us in the classroom had to be socially distanced. They all had to sit at their own table and some year groups uh, wearing masks, but group seating was not allowed. And this meant that we had to unlearn and relearn how to group the children for reading. And it meant that we had to adopt a whole class reading approach, providing that support for children who perhaps couldn't access the text. And what we learned from that is that Usually, every year when we group the children by ability, despite having regular assessments and all of those groups being fluid and children are able to move to the next group depending on their progress, the children in the lowest ability groups, while they do make progress, they largely remain as a group as they move through the year. But this year, during the pandemic, we actually found that we don't have children who are stuck in lower ability reading groups. More of our children, in Key Stage 1 in particular, are reading at a higher level. And the reason for this, we believe, is that all of our children have, had, have had access to stage-appropriate, age-appropriate uh, reading materials and there's been a higher expectation for all students. Self-efficacy is the belief that we have in ourselves to be able to do something. It's the belief that we have in our own success. And there are two things which are the sort of main factors in self-efficacy. The first one is about experiencing mastery. So if you're learning something brand new, and you start to experience some success with that, it makes you believe that you can do it. It gives you that self-efficacy. The second most important factor in determining self-efficacy is observing others be successful. Again, if we think about learning new things, if we see our peers, people in our family, people around us being successful, it makes us believe that we can do that too. Self-efficacy is extremely important for children who are learning to read. Self-efficacy is very strongly linked to motivation 
And we need our students to have motivation when it comes to learning to read. We can't determine what our children bring with them to the classroom. Each child with their own unique family, their own interests, their own culture, their beliefs. And each child will bring their own repertoire of language, vocabulary to the classroom. There is thought to be a 30 million word gap by the age of three years old between children who come from the lowest income families and children who come from more affluent families. And the reason for that is thought to be the language that they're exposed to, the vocabulary that they're exposed to, and more recently, some research around the conversations that they've been exposed to, whether they've heard them or taken part in those conversations. After children have learned to decode text, um, or you know, whether they've learned through a whole language or whole word approach, once they've actually um, learned how to read, their reading comprehension largely relies on their knowledge of language and their knowledge of the world. I'm sure that many of you can relate to this, but when I was at university, I remember going to the university library and picking out research papers to read for you know, exams and, and tests and things. And some of those research papers, I felt as though I absolutely couldn't read them because they were so laden with context-specific vocabulary, um, lots of words that just weren't in my repertoire that I wasn't used to, to hearing or using. And it made it really difficult for me to be able to read that text. And children experience this um, from a very young age. Really, we need to know a lot about language. And we also need um, a sort of extensive or, or wide knowledge about the world. If you think about two children in the same class, so maybe around the middle of the primary school, and you've got a lower ability reader who loves basketball, knows everything there is to know about basketball. They play it at the weekends, they watch it on the television. You've got another child in that class who's a high ability reader who knows nothing about basketball. If you give both of those children a text based around basketball, you might find that that lower ability reader, and probably will find, that they would have better comprehension of that text after reading. So really, knowledge helps children um, when they are learning to read, and that vocabulary and that knowledge of language will help them with their reading comprehension. Throughout a child's time in school, there are lots of uh, sort of checkpoints um, where we have to assess the children and see how they're getting on with their learning. So if we think about end of key stage one requirements, end of key stage two requirements, possibly SATs at that stage, and then eventually um, checkpoints which actually count as qualifications and will determine you know, where that child goes to university, what they'll study, what their job is going to be. So thinking about um, GCSE qualifications, A-level qualifications. Ability groups are great in theory, but if that's the only thing that you do in that subject, you're never going to close the gap for those, those children who are in lower ability groups. You're eventually going to run out of time. You don't have infinite time before children come to those qualifications like GCSE and A-level, you will eventually run out of time if, abil if ability groups is the only thing that you're doing. So what does all this mean for the teaching of reading? Over the last year, I have slowly come to the real realization or the opinion that we need to be doing both when teaching children to read. We need to have children working in ability groups where they are getting to experience that success, they're in the safety net of that group, they've got texts which are um, accessible to them, and they can see themselves making that progress. And that's them experiencing success, they're getting that self-efficacy. But we also need whole class reading opportunities, particularly for those students who are not reading at an age or stage appropriate level. They have to hear the vocabulary that's expected 
at that age or stage level. Um, they have to be able to take part in rich discussion, class discussions around the text, you know, thinking about um, inference, discussions around what happens if we say this in a different way? Can you read it like this? What if we play with the punctuation here? What will happen? Why did the author use this word? Lots and lots of discussion. And some of you in the room that are teachers or leaders in school will probably, where are you going to find the time to do this? But I think we need to look carefully at the time that we spend for reading and the activities that we're giving children, perhaps as follow-ups. Do they need to have those activities? Is there ways of getting more discussion into the reading lesson, shared reading, um, guided reading, the teacher modeling that reading process? And this is something that I'm really looking forward to developing this year in my school. And we've managed to um, sort of carve out time in the timetable already to allow for that. The global pandemic has forced us to um, try lots of new things uh, within teaching and learning so that our children could still experience success this year. If it wasn't for the pandemic, I don't think we would have taken such a gamble, particularly with our um, FS2 and our uh, Key Stage 1 students. However, we have learned important lessons and I hope that we can use those lessons to make learning better in the future. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of today's conference. We hope you found today's talks thought-provoking and inspiring. The videos of today's talks will be uploaded on the official TEDx website in due course and will be available to view online. Before you leave, we'd like to request our principal, Mr. Campbell Douglas, to say a few words. Please welcome onto stage, Mr. Campbell Douglas. Good evening, everyone. It's my absolute privilege to stand before you and to be invited here to say a few closing words. Although I have to say, after hearing tonight's speakers, I'm a little more than uh, nervous about that. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree that what we have heard here tonight is nothing short of fantastic. And each individual's interpretation of what the new normal will look like in a post-pandemic world has been absolutely fascinating to listen to. But what has really stood out for me tonight is the absolute passion and conviction that our speakers have had here tonight on their chosen topics. And it's been great to see them stand up here and present to us with that passion and that conviction. I think that if we had these people here in charge of our post-pandemic world, then I think we can all agree that the world is going to be in safe hands. So my heartfelt thanks and congratulations to all the speakers tonight. I think you are absolutely brilliant. Can we have a round of applause for our speakers, please? You. Another thing I want to acknowledge this evening is our academy community. This event is very much a community event run by our our staff of our school, um, obviously compared by our students with speakers from our academy community. And what we've heard tonight are some amazing talks, and I feel very proud and very humbled and very privileged to be part of the leadership team that helps lead the school. They were absolutely fantastic and a testament uh, to the school here, uh, and we're very proud to have these people as part of our community. Of course, events like this don't just happen overnight. And today, I also want to acknowledge people you have not seen today, but are working tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure that this event has been a great success. So to our IT team, to Atwith, to Dilshan and Bridget, thank you so much for your work in ensuring the technical expertise that was here tonight. I would also like to thank our operations team, Manu, uh, Roland and Jyoti for the amazing work they've done to get things sorted here and to have our facilities looking amazing. Thank you so much to them also. 
And finally, I want to acknowledge the organizer of today's event, Mr. Rohan Roberts. Rohan has worked tirelessly over the past few months to ensure its success. He's coordinated the staff, the students, the tech and the ops team. Uh, and of course, an event like this is difficult enough in normal times, but to arrange something like this during COVID uh, has also been outstanding. So to Rohan, thank you so much. Uh, and I know, yeah, well done, thank you. I know that you've created an event here that will certainly be a legacy event for the Academy, and we're very grateful for that. So that brings us to the end of the evening. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, and just a few logistics. When you leave, please, as you leave the auditorium and you go out the front doors, you can either go left or right and out the glass doors either side of the building. But there is tea and coffee there on your way out. If you'd like to get that on the way out, you're very welcome to stay and have a, uh, a coffee and a tea and a, a chat. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you for support. Uh, and I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. I'm feeling my heart Beating me the reason I feel but it's all in I love this feeling Yeah, yeah But I can't deny it She turns me on I can't control this burning desire I wish we could have it further the sun. That no one is when there is a trick in her who works on me so well. And I can't deny she turns me on like a fire cooker in the summer sun. Slow fading with the smell of her perfume And when she's dancing Oh, I tell I'm